In Rome, there is a museum called the Little Museum of Purgatory. In it are contained items touched by visitors from Purgatory. Things like prayer books and bedsheets, all with handprints burned into them. Handprints left by those who were burning in Purgatory. These poor, burning souls appeared in apparitions, asking an individual in our world to pray for them. And the prayer they often requested was the greatest of all prayers, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. In this episode, I will be trekking back to the origin of the Gregorian Mass, which is the historical practice of offering a series of 30 Masses for the poor souls in purgatory. God bless America. God love you. I want these to be my first words of greeting to you. They will be the concluding words on each broadcast. I am not the Catholic candidate for president. I am the Democratic Party's candidate for president. Annuncio office. Gaudium magnum. Abemus papam. You've embarked on a Catholic history trek. Since this episode is about Gregorian Masses for the poor souls in purgatory, I should probably explain the Catholic doctrine on purgatory. I assume if you're listening to a podcast on Catholic history, you probably know what purgatory is, but for the benefit of those who may not, I'll provide a brief explanation. Our pop culture gets much wrong about the Catholic faith, and purgatory is no exception. Purgatory is not a place where one goes to get a second chance, or has the opportunity to earn heaven. And it's not a third option for those not good enough for heaven, but not bad enough for hell. So, what is purgatory? That is question 1381 in the Baltimore Catechism. The answer, provided by the Catechism, states, Purgatory is the state in which those suffer for a time who die guilty of venial sin, or without having satisfied for the punishment due to their sins. We get the word purgatory from the Latin verb purgo, or purgare, meaning to make clean. And this is addressed in the follow-up question in the Catechism. Question 1382 explains why it is called purgatory. Because in it, the souls are purged or purified from all their stains. In this temporary state, the souls are cleaned or purged on their way to heaven, and a few questions later, in number 1385, we find it asked whether the faithful on earth can help the souls in purgatory. The answer provided is that the faithful on earth can help the souls in purgatory by their prayers, fasts, alms, deeds, by indulgences, and by having masses said for them. So where do these Christian traditions come from, of souls being purified between death and heaven, and fellow men on earth being able to offer assistance in that endeavor? Well, Like many Christian practices, it takes its root with the people of God's original covenant. Jesus and the twelve apostles were Jews. They practiced the Jewish traditions, and the earliest Christians brought some of these traditions with them into the new covenant, including purgatory and praying for the deceased. Today, Orthodox Jews retain this practice 2,000 years later with the mourner's Kaddish, which are prayers offered for a loved one after their death to be purified. We find this Jewish practice of praying for the dead explicitly detailed in the Old Testament. Anyone familiar with apologetics knows 2 Maccabees is the place to turn for the scriptural reference to purgatory. In 2 Maccabees chapter 12, we find that some of the Maccabean soldiers had committed the sin of secretly wearing pagan idols, which was discovered when their fellow Jews went to bury their slain bodies. Having discovered the idols which had been hidden under their coats, The Jews prayed for their fallen brothers, atoning for the sin which had been committed, that it might be forgotten. And so they gathered 12,000 drachmas of silver, which they sent to Jerusalem for a sacrifice to be offered for the sin of the dead, in hopes they would rise again at the resurrection of the dead. Of course, if you go looking for this Old Testament book, you will need to look in a Catholic Bible. As Maccabees was one of the books selectively purged, by Martin Luther when he decided to craft his own personal canon of scripture some 1,200 years after the biblical canon had been established. Luther's first German translations removed a number of books, including the Epistle of James, which he infamously dubbed as, Straw not worthy to be burned, and my oven is tinder. 
and Maccabees, which was among many Old Testament books he derided as nothing more than Judaizing nonsense. Fortunately, the early Christians were not tainted by Luther's radical teachings and continued this practice of praying for the dead. A pair of 2nd century Christian writings, the Acts of Paul and Thelka, and also the Martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicity, both make reference of the Christian practice of praying for the dead. In the early days of Christianity, when it was illegal to publicly profess the Christian faith, masses were often celebrated in the catacombs upon the tombs of the martyrs. In these catacombs, another historical record of praying for the dead can be found, in the form of inscriptions carved by some of these early Christians. These carved words formed prayers offered for the deceased. The ancient apostolic constitutions in paragraph 41 of book 8 offers a prayer for the departed, which begins, Let us pray for our brethren that are at rest in Christ, that God, the lover of mankind, who has received his soul, may forgive him every sin. And another example from the 4th century is that of St. Monica. The mother of the famous St. Augustine requested that he remember to pray for her soul at his masses after she died. Her request is recorded in his Confessions, where we find the line of his mother's, Lay this body anywhere at all, the care of it must not trouble you. This only I ask of you, that you remember me at the altar of the Lord, wherever you are. In his work, The City of God, Augustine had said, Temporary punishments are suffered by some in this life only, by others after death, and by others both now and then. If these souls were in hell, no prayers would benefit them, and if they were in heaven, no prayers would be necessary for them. So these prayers for the dead would only make sense if, in the apostolic age, there was a belief in a state between death and heaven. The state is the purgation which St. Augustine speaks of with these temporary punishments after death, and it is for deliverance from this which St. Monica and the others sought prayers, which was alluded to in the New Testament. The Gospel of Matthew mentions a particular sin, one that can neither be forgiven in this world nor in the world to come. By explicitly pointing out that this sin cannot be forgiven in the next world, it would seem to imply there are sins which can be expiated or atoned for in the next world. St. Paul calls God a consuming fire and showed that every man's work shall be manifest and revealed in this fire, a fire through which one will be saved, though he suffer loss. There's no salvation in hell and no suffering in heaven, so one traditional interpretation has held that this consuming fire which causes suffering, but through which one is saved, is the purgation through which one is made clean for heaven. And one must be made clean and strive for holiness, for St. Paul warns, without which no one will see the Lord. A sentiment echoed by St. John, in revelations that nothing unclean or defiled shall be found in heaven. In both the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus provides the parable of seeking to be reconciled before facing the judge, for he will cast you into prison until you pay the very last penny. Both St. Jerome and St. Augustine call this penny the smallest earthly sins. This can be seen as a reference to being reconciled before the judgment. For God will cast one into purgatory until every stain of sin is remitted, which is not atoned for in this life. By the mid-6th century, when this doctrine of purgatory had become a long-established tradition, a child named Gregory was born into a wealthy Italian family. His father, Gordianus, was the Roman prefect, and Gregory, who excelled in his studies and the law, became the prefect of Rome by his early 30s. Upon his father's death, Gregory converted the large family estate into a monastery. The monastery still exists today, called the San Gregorio Magna a Cielo. With his excellent intelligence and aptitude with law, Pope Pelagius II pulled Gregory out of the monastery and called him up to serve as a papal legate to the imperial court in Byzantium. And after the Pope's death, Gregory was selected as his successor. Despite raising protests, Gregory was compelled to become Pope Gregory. Today, we know Pope Gregory is Pope Gregory I and Pope Gregory the Great, and he has made an appearance in several of our previous Catholic History Trek episodes. It was his writings which provided the material we know of St. Benedict as covered in our episode on the St. Benedict Medal, 
and it was Gregory's procession in 590, which brought about the end of the Great Roman Plague, which was covered in our history of the St. Michael prayer. One of Gregory the Great's great achievements was his composition of the Dialogues. Written during his papacy, it's a four-book volume documenting the life and miracles of the Italian Church Fathers, as he wrote to Bishop Maximianus of Syracuse, My brethren who dwell familiarly with me would have me by all means write something in brief fashion concerning the miracles of the Fathers, which we have heard wrought in Italy. The origin of Gregorian Masses, the topic of this episode, appears in the fourth book of this Dialogues. Gregory recounts a monk from his monastery named Eustus, who is very skillful in medicines. When Eustus was on his deathbed, it was discovered by his brother monks that he had broken the vow of poverty by secretly concealing three gold coins for himself. Gregory became very troubled by the sin of Eustus and thinking for the edification of the fellow monks and for the salvation of the soul of Eustus, Gregory refused to allow any physical comfort for the ailing monk and ordered the fellow monks to abandon him at his final hour. When Eustus died, Gregory then ordered he not be buried amongst the other monks of the community, but to make a grave for him in a dunghill and cast his body in it with the three gold coins, crying out, Thy money be with thee unto perdition. A month later, Gregory began to think of grief for the punishment he had placed upon Eustus. He spoke with the prior of the monastery and requested that he offer the sacrifice of the Mass for 30 consecutive days for the absolution and discharge of Eustus from the torments of fire which he would now be in. A while later, Eustus appeared to his earthly brother Copiosus, conveying to him that until this day he had been in a bad case, but now was well. Copiosus immediately came to the monastery and related the vision to the monks, knowing nothing of the masses being offered for his brother. Upon hearing the story, the monks did the math and realized it was the 30th day of consecutive masses being offered for the repose of the soul of Eustus. As Gregory recorded in the dialogues, it became apparent to the monks that by the holy sacrifice, Eustus had been delivered from his pains in purgatory and delivered unto heaven. From this recorded incident of the monk Eustus, we have the origin of the series of 30 consecutive masses offered for the release of a poor soul in purgatory. For over a thousand years, these Gregorian masses, as they're now called, have been offered by Catholics. But, because they require 30 consecutive masses be prayed, it's not like one can just visit their local parish and request them. It's going to be difficult to find a parish that has 30 consecutive days open, and some churches don't even offer masses on 30 consecutive days. One could do the legwork of contacting many local churches, finding what days have open mass intentions, and try to arrange it so that you can get 30 consecutive masses offered by splitting them at different churches, but there's a much easier route. Today you can easily find Catholic missions and associations online who you can request Gregorian masses from. It's as easy as searching for Gregorian masses. Groups who offer them today include the Missionaries of the Holy Family, the National Shrine of Divine Mercy, the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, the Vincentians of Our Lady of Angels, the American Chestahovas Shrine, the Salesians, the Society of the Divine Word, and various Franciscan missions and groups. The Mass stipends vary, but it's typically around $300, which is $10 per Mass times 30 Masses. Some of these groups request up to $400 or $500, and others, like the Missionaries of the Holy Family, only ask for $200. And as an aside, this is who my wife and I have used to have Gregorian Masses said for family and friends who have passed. These groups do the work of scheduling the Masses with the various priests so they can get 30 of them said consecutively. And donating for these Gregorian Masses is a great way to fund their missionary activities. From the earliest days of the church and even before, the people of God have offered prayers and sacrifices for those who have died. This ancient tradition is defined in the Declaration of Purgatory from the Second Council of Leon, convened in 1274. To summarize the Council's declaration, If those who are truly repentant die in charity before they have done sufficient penance for their sins, their souls are cleansed after death in purgatorial or cleansing punishment. The suffrages of the faithful on earth can be of great help in relieving these punishments, as, for instance, 
the sacrifice of the Mass. A few centuries later, the Council of Trent reinforced this teaching, declaring an anathema on any who denied it. When a loved one dies today, it's too common to hear sentiments such as, at least he's no longer suffering, or he's in a better place. But for 2,000 years, Christians would have considered such platitudes as heretical, as denying the reality of the purification between this life and heaven. Because purgatory is suffering, it's not a better place. But when people say such things, they neglect the poor souls, mistakenly treating the suffering souls as if they were already in heaven. This is why St. John Vianney chastised those who called him a living saint. Because if they said such things, they would neglect to pray for him when he died, and he would be forced to spend more time in purgatory than would be necessary. As St. John Vianney explained, the fire of purgatory is the same as the fire of hell. The difference between them is that the fire of purgatory is not everlasting. He also said, We must say many prayers for the souls of the faithful departed, for one must be so pure to enter heaven. When a loved one dies, you could plant a tree in memory of them, donate money to some charity on their behalf, and even rate, like, and subscribe this podcast in their honor. But there's perhaps nothing more loving we can do for them than to look after their spiritual welfare and have Gregorian Masses said for them. And I can't end this episode with 30 Masses, but I can end it with a prayer for the faithful departed, prayed in the church's traditional language of Latin. Requiem eternam, dona eis domine, et lux perpetua, luceat eis. Amen. Thank you for listening to Catholic History Trek. You can reach us at catholichistorytrek.com at gmail.com.